That really is beautiful fish. So right there, see where it separates? Yeah. You want to try one? And you just go all the way down the fillet that way? Mm-hmm. Look at how nicely spaced out mine are. You're hired. 20, 30 years from now, when you're talking to your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, you can say, there was this one white guy came here a long, long time ago. You should have seen him stake out that salmon filet. It was else. the best filet we ever ate. It was the best. Look, I mean, look at that. <laughs> the splayed filets are staked around an alder wood fire to slow roast to perfection. Yeah, I'm doing this at my house this way come spring. Yeah, simple. Completely. It's so good. As the women finalize the meal, Bridget's nephews, Roland and Neil, gather several of the men in true powwow fashion. You want to get in on it? Huh? <laughs> you want to get yeah, in pull on up it? Sure. Yeah, yeah, pull up the chair. Our round dances originated in uh, Canada from the Cree Confederation. Circle dance and shake hands, meet everybody kind sure. of dance. Mm -hmm. All right, so the round dance. Ceremony is at the heart of tribal culture, honoring all the earth provides to give us life. Wild carrots, bitter roots, and biscuit roots. Huckleberries and choke cherries. River smelt, lamprey, and of course, salmon. These are the first foods of the tribes of the Columbia. That was great. <laughs> Look at that style. Let's get a round of applause for that style right now, actually. The guy can cook and dress. This is, I call this old, chic, white New York Jew. <laughs> well, you nailed cool it. Cool sneakers, <laughs> jeans that are a little too tight, a shirt you nailed that's a little it. too wrinkly. You nailed it. Well, I, I love this show. I think so many people out there do. I can't wait for this next season. Um, but I want to start a little bit at the beginning. You know, I sure. feel like some people don't really know your full story. So sure. how'd you start cooking? How'd you first become a chef? Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, I knew when I was three or four years old, I loved food. Uh, my parents were both uh, food-driven mm. uh, folks. Um, my dad traveled internationally. My wife, uh, my mom had gone to college in San Francisco and her roommate uh, was Vic Bergeron's uh, daughter. Now, Vic Bergeron founded a chain of restaurants, Polynesian restaurants, that swept the name. It was the Hard Rock Cafe of the 1950s and 60s called Trader Vic's. Yeah. So uh, Vic Bergeron taught my mother to cook. So she was the only woman on the Upper East Side in 1965 making, you know, Pan-Asian cuisine mm. in, in a walk mm. before it was cool to do so. So we were, we traveled to eat and ate to travel. And I just, I remember being in a tiny little bar late at night, uh, 1970, 71. I was 10, 11 years old. I was with my father and he was in the advertising business and we were in Leal, um, when Leal was Leal, when it was a sleepy little, you know, wharf area with stevedores and there was a, an element of danger uh, there in the seafood market uh, just on the edge of Paris. And we went into this dive bar that just reeked of like clam juice and wine that had <laughs> spilled on the floor for like a hundred years. That smells pretty nice, I'm sure. It, we, you know, it was a bad smell, but then the smell of like garlic and parsley and mm. butter cooking. And uh, my dad was having a meeting with his the guy that worked for him at the Paris office and had suggested this place to my father because there was such great food there. Mm. And out came, I was bored, you know, I'm 10, my dad's talking business, I'm looking around, but the, the romanticism of, you know, the, there was fog, there was, mm. you know, any, someone could get hurt at any moment. It felt like someone had pulled a <laughs> shiv just the <laughs> night before last, and out came this platter of bigorneau, mm. these snails, the small blue ones, periwinkles. Mm. And there was this giant needle on the top of it, and I kind of looked down, and my father said, you use that and you pick them out. And the periwinkles, it's, it's a tiny little bite. It's like half a jelly bean. Yeah. But it's meant to be like peanuts, you know, while you're waiting for your other stuff, and you take a piece of bread and you sop up the juices that are at the bottom. And I remember sitting there that night and eating every one of those things off that plate. And I just, <laughs> there was something about moments like that that mm. just implanted into my conscious that that's where I wanted to be. And listening to Jacques Kahn, tell the stories of that place and the history 
of why Leal was Leal and how there'd been a seafood market there for a thousand years and what that meant to the city and how the seafood went out to these incredible places in Paris. And as the night wore on, the place got busier. So, you know, we got there at nine, at midnight it was packed. I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. And I kept working in restaurants when I was in high school. My father said, get a job during the summertime. <laughs> so all my friends went to work for the landscaping place and I didn't want to haul 20 pound plastic bags of animal dung <laughs> onto some rich lady's rose garden and you know, spread, you know, cultivate it. And so I got, I wanted to work in restaurants and the child labor laws being what they were, uh, you know, a friend of a friend, you know, was like, oh, we got a place. And so I started shucking clams and making salad at a tiny little roadside seafood cafe called The Quiet Clam in Amagansett in 1975. And I would do that at night. And so I got to spend the day on the beach, which I loved. And then at night I would go to work and there was something about the theater of it. Mm. Every night was different. It was an open and closing. The audience was different. The excitement was different. There was a different success every night. There was a different problem every night. Mm -hmm. And I, that was it. I was hooked. And, and I, I think also I had my desire, you know, my higher power's grace yeah. teamed up with a, a, a talent that I had for it. And that was it. I was off to the races and I worked in a lot of great restaurants and did a lot of great things in the food business before turning my attention to television 15 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, w would you, do you remember the first dish that you made that was beyond like a PB and J? Do you remember the first thing that you actually like concepted and, and made? Concepted and made, uh, nothing is really invented out of whole cloth. In, in food or in television. Mm. Uh, what you have are people like, it's like jazz music, it's riffing off something else. It's why, I, it's why music and food use the same you know, vocabulary, the same imagery, because they're so closely uh, linked. Mm. Um, I'll make a bad metaphor, but chefs have been sampling, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, <laughs> each other's food for thousands of years, mm. right? Occasionally, every once in a while, somebody actually invents right. something new. Right. Uh, but I do remember, and it ties in neatly with my career, my first job as a head chef was at the Conscience Point Inn in Southampton, Long Island in 1984 or something like that. It's a pretty and good gig right there. It, it wasn't bad. I mean, I'd worked in some good restaurants. I had come back from Europe. I had done some, I'd been in some great kitchens there and in Hong Kong and came back and a friend of mine said, oh, they, they need a chef, summertime resort restaurant. You know, it's, it's open May 1st to, you know, September 30th. Mm. And uh, cool thing, and of course, like many Hamptons places in the 80s, Friday and Saturday night, tables come up at 10 o'clock. It's a nightclub, so it was perfect for me because I was a drug addict, an active drug addict and alcoholic. <laughs> Ah, I was an active drug addict and alcoholic. I spilled my vodka, and <laughs> that's your, your conscious thank yeah, you. helping you out. Uh, and so it was the perfect place for me at the time because it was just like there were no rules. I mean, 1984 in restaurants, there were I mean no rules. I mean, whatever gets you through the service. And but I got to put on the menu fire, and the menu's hanging in my kitchen at home. I got to put on a uh, a steamed shellfish dish that I'd had in Amsterdam. Uh, that was loaded with mussels and seafood, obviously, whatever is in season, uh, like a French grand aioli, you know, layer it with slices of fennel and onion and carrot and celery and other vegetables from the farm stand. I included corn and stacking the seafood in there and build them in little pots and you just boil them to order and serve them with two or three dipping sauces. Some of the fun things that we got to do there that I, dishes that I had seen elsewhere and I would tell my staff, they'd say, oh, we haven't seen that before. So you have to tell them the story. Yeah. And food with a story is better than food without one. And food with a story that someone hasn't heard about is better than that. And food with a story that people haven't heard about but they can relate to mm. is the best of all. And I did that for 15 years in kitchens, traveling and telling stories and bringing food from my travels back in to my kitchens. And then I decided I needed a bigger audience because mm. I was a natural for TV, which means huge ego, no self-esteem at all. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you were a pretty adventurous eater throughout your career as a chef as well. Do you remember yeah. ever chasing down a particular dish in Hong Kong or Amsterdam or you know one of those sort of dishes you were like, I need to have this, I'll go wherever it takes? Every 
day <laughs> of the week. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the tough ones are a lot of the illegal or gray market foods. I mean, I've never eaten an endangered species, but there are certain foods that are very difficult to find. Kasu marzu, which is the maggot infested uh, goat's milk cheese of uh, Sardinia, is uh, appetizing. It's fantastic. The, the maggots infest the cheese while it's soft. Mm. Then it hardens, the maggots are inside. They eat the cheese, they poop out the cheese, and they create a soft jelly-like environment inside. And people always say, I like, love just oh, it's- Watching the audience reactions while you're talking is my favorite they part They think of it's runny cheese, but it's not. It's actually a mixture of cheese and maggot poop. Mm. <laughs> so the, the Sardinian government found that a lot of people were trying to buy black market Kasumarzu and the sort of adventure eating, excuse me, the adventure eating crew that I, I mean, just, I finally got to taste it six years into my show. So I think I was re responsible for the problem as well as uh, optimizing my solution. Mm. But we found Giovanni Gabas, the last maker of Kazumarzu, who was doing it illegally in his mountaintop home where he was a goat herder. He walked with a limp because he was walking on a mountain his whole life. And uh, I don't know how many people have seen the Sardinia show, but it's one of the best hours of TV we've I ever I recommend made. people go back and watch it for sure. And uh, yeah, so thank you. And it, it, to eat the Kasumarzu with him and connect the dots historically was fantastic. It took us a, two or three years to run it down. It was on the board at the, you know, Kasumarzu, gotta have it mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Um, and then there's things like, you know, Ortolans and all the little baby birds in Vietnam that, you know, there's someone who's like, yeah, come on down the street, you know? <laughs> and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful world mm. to explore. If I was just doing it for thrill-seeking, it would be pointless. It would almost be insulting to the other cultures, and I think it, it would betray a shallowness about myself that isn't there. <laughs> I, I really believe that in a world where we always define ourselves by our differences, you know, we have different skin color, we like to screw different people, we have a different concept of God. I can say screw on AOL. Absolutely, you can say uh, other words if you'd like. You know, the, uh, you know we have different uh, skin color, we like different music, we believe in different higher powers or maybe no higher power at all. And we, we spend too much time arguing about the things that divide us. I want to celebrate something that unites us as a way, if, 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 I can, if I can get to know somebody over a plate of food, uh, we can become friends. If we can become friends, maybe I can learn something about their ideas, maybe they can learn some about mine, and if that keeps, you know, and so on, and so with that Breck commercial, and you know, so on and so on, yeah. uh, eventually I think it help, helps make the world a better place. Now, I think in 2017 in America, that idea has never been more powerfully needed. This is not a political discourse, this is a civics right. discourse. I wanna know what you think and you think and you think because we all live here. Mm. You know, this is my country, our foundational principle of this republic is all men and women are created equal and yet we all have different ideas and desires and goals and aims and the more we share that, actually share that with each other, the better off we all are. And some people see my show as fat white guy goes around world eats bugs. I get it, that's fine. <laughs> that's and if that's, that, if that's, if that's how they yes. wanna see it, God bless them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know I make an entertainment program on an entertainment lifestyle network. Mm. But I believe in the higher purpose of what we're doing with every ounce of my being. I believe that when somebody sees someone halfway across the world eating something kind of outrageous and they lean in and then they see me talking to their grandmother who's cooking it and they're like, oh my God, that was just like me and my grandmother when I was little. Yeah. Something allows us to accept those people in that place and their beliefs at a deeper level level and I think it's I, I think it's important work I, I mean also I'm hysterical uh, but you know it's I just think it's important stuff yeah absolutely and I think it sounds like you had a pretty ironed out concept when you were, were creating the show did you discuss it with the executives at Travel Channel I mean how did you get in the room with those guys and, and be able to come up with this I sold a lie <laughs> Um, no, I was, uh, you know, I went to Travel Channel. They said it's a great idea, it's brilliant. You, you know, go to PBS, make eight of them, have a nice life. I said, I want a big platform. I want to be the food guy on Travel Channel. They said, well, you, you're a 
just a dude with an idea. You know, you've got to get a production company and go back, come back and show us five minutes of something that works. So I went and found a production company and we shot five minutes of something and then we started to have real conversations. You, do you remember what that was? Can you? Uh, yeah, I shot, a, I shot five minutes of uh, material in Minnesota. Uh, oh, we well, were, the, the, the tourist destination Minnesota. Don't be knocking Minnesota. <laughs> I'm trying to instigate something obviously here. The, uh, the great part about that scene was we actually, I did an ostrich farm and an elk farm, and I think I ate elk balls, and I think I got an ostrich, I was grilling ostrich meat outside the ostrich pen, and I got an ostrich to eat a piece of the grilled ostrich meat, thereby making him an ostrich cannibal. And the network was kind of hooked at that point. Um, <laughs> But I had That's this big meeting where they, right you know, they, they tossed me a laser pointer and they had a map of the world, Discovery owned Travel Channel at the point. They had a map that was the size of that wall in their big office building in uh, Bethesda or Chevy Chase in Washington, D.C. at the time. And I walked around the world and I just started pointing at countries and telling stories about foods that were outrageous and they were sold. Mm. Now, I knew that I had to sell a show with a hook. Knew it. I mean, that's the way TV works. You have something grabby that makes people stay through it. But if I can get them to stay with it and stick through it, then they'll hear my ideas about things. And I also watched TV a lot and studied TV. I mean, really studied it. And what I saw was, you know, the first year, you know, it's, you know, the Charles Thorpe show, you know? And the, sec you right now. the second year, it's, you know, the Charles Thorpe show produced by Charles Thorpe. And the <laughs> third year, if you get a third season, it's a big hit, and it's, you know, the Charles Sharp, written and directed by Charles Thorpe, executive producer Charles Thorpe, right? So it's, you, you the leverage swings over to the talent. Mm. And so I, I knew, you know, kind of like, you know, Achilles and the Trojan horse of yore, let's build this thing, let's... And, and I, not in a conspiratorial way. I mean, it was very transparent about it. And they said, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like, bring it to the past, let it be a hit. And then I'll, every year I'll add 5% more intelligence to this show. And I think now we have, especially with this season, have the coolest, smartest, most relevant food and travel year of TV, mm -hmm. season of television that anybody has ever made. I really, truly believe that. Yeah, and I, I've gotten a chance to look at a couple of the episodes. I'm so excited to, for the rest of the world to see this show. But can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the idea of going about uh, Lewis and Clark's uh, trail? It's, it's actually what it, where I started with the show at that meeting uh, with the pointer. I actually took them down journeys. What I wanted to do was, rather than picking a city like we, we do now, you know, Fez, Morocco, mm. you know, St. Petersburg, Russia. I said, let's follow the Orient Express. Let's do Highway 4 that separates uh, northern Vietnam with China. Let's go uh, across the Lewis and Clark Trail. Let's take Hunter S. Thompson's drive from you know, Barstow into Las Vegas. Let's, let's do all these famous journeys mm. that there are around the world to be taken mm. and explore the foods and culture along the way. So we went back to the oldest idea, you know, when they called me and said, what do you want to do this season? I said, I want to do what I originally wanted to do with this show. And I, I just think it's a fantastic way to immerse people in a, in, in a show. I mean, you're riveted because, you know, Lewis and Clark, you know, went through the Missouri River, down through the Columbia River, and out to the Pacific, right? And Thomas Jefferson had said, you know, go west. You know, we have to find a route uh, to the west. And along the way, such tragedy, such amazing storytelling, survival, grit, and pluck, and they were, without the help of the first peoples of the Pacific North, Northwest, all the different tribes that they met, and of Central America, uh, Central United States as well, um, they wouldn't have survived. They would have been dead 100 miles outside of where they started. Mm. So I wanted to meet the descendants of those people who helped those explorers and see where they're out at now. And what I saw was both uplifting and heroic and tragic and shameful. The tribal peoples who were on the Columbia River, who gave them fish, taught them what to do with salmon, helped supply them, uh, nursed their wounds, uh, were then, 100 years later, picked up from the, the place that they had lived for a 1,000 years and moved inland to a, a fucking desert. Right. I mean, it's just the, yeah. one of the great crimes in our country's history, and top five crimes. <laughs> and 
now these people hung on mm -hmm. and they maintained by treaty right these fishing platforms. We won't let you live here, but you can fish the river a little bit. Mm -hmm. So 100 years after that, we're in the year 2000 and that part of the Columbia River, the fish populations are dying. The fish industry there is falling off. The tourism industry is falling off and it's all because of how we were treating the river. Mm -hmm. So they turned to the tribes and the tribal peoples taught them how to take care of the river, limit the fishing, use certain kinds of old school methodology that only took certain sized fish, mm. you know, hoop netting instead of gill netting. Gill netting, you catch lots of salmon. Gill netting, you catch lots of salmon, you harm them, they're not pristine. Hoop netting, they're unharmed. Anyway, long story short, you talk to the DNR people now on the Columbia River, especially that last 100 miles uh, stretch, and they're like, without the first peoples, the tribal peoples, our river wouldn't be in the condition it's in now. It's never been cleaner. Mm -hmm. it, they've had three record years of salmon spawning, meaning new fish returning to the ocean, which is what we want, yeah. uh, and record numbers of fish that are coming out of the river itself for human consumption. So the, the, everything has come around to this ancient wisdom yeah. that we have said well, we're not really interested in for a long time. And that is contempt prior to investigation. That's judging a book by its cover. And that's probably the biggest other meme of our show is to be patient, tolerant, and understanding with people because everyone's idea is valid and worth something. Yeah, I think what I think is really beautiful about uh, this next uh, round of episodes is you do show the tribal people and their connection with their food and their mm -hmm. understanding of where it comes from. I mean, as someone that's eating... Uh, as a career, what do you think about uh, America's detachment with what we're eating and 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 uh, our attachment, our detachment from what we're eating, how we're not what understanding way? where things are coming from? As we're just things are plopped on a plate in front of us, and instead of going to a farmer, you know, going to a marketplace. I, I think you're wrong. Okay. Um, I think we are in the middle of a, tw and I know why you're, I know why you're wrong because what you're, you're seeing what's happening today. I'm looking at a 30-year social justice movement sufficient to recover from the messy place that we've placed our food system, mm -hmm. okay? So when you're, when you're in the middle of that, you're, it's like an ocean crossing. There's no land anywhere. So you're right. A lot of people are detached from it. But by the same token, the idea of what a farmer gives us has value and all this stuff is, is starting to catch on. I'm petrified about the current administration, the new agriculture secretary, I and mean, there's tons of things that tell me we might be going backwards a little bit. Um, I think we have to uh, get um, very, very serious about how we treat every place the federal dollar intersects with food. I'd love to tell you that I'm really concerned with restaurants and whether or not someone is their $30 roast chicken is worth it because it comes from some fancy farm in Maryland. Um, but I really don't care about that one percenter thing, despite the fact that I am a one percenter and I do eat that bespoke chicken. What I'm more concerned about is taking chicken production out of the hands of the few and putting it back into the hands of the many, I think is an economic development program, a social justice program, a health and wellness program. I think when the, when, what we've done with our food system is slowly but surely being corrected, and I think we need to approach it from a legislative point of view. There's a large group of us. I mean, you know, people like Jose Andres, people like Tom Calicchio, um, I, I include myself in that group, who spend a lot of time fighting, lobbying, working with, you know, NGOs, and doing a lot of work both in this country and in others to try to correct the nature of where we're headed food-wise. I, I'm bullish, I'm a glass half full person. I believe we're gonna decentralize our food system. I think we're gonna make it healthier. I think we're gonna start feeding kids in schools the right way. I, I look out at a lot of young faces here who know more about food than the generation before them did. My son is 11 and a half years old and he can correct your pronunciation of the word pho. <laughs> which I tell him all the time, it's like, we live in Minnesota, it's pho. If you were in Vietnam and ordering it, you would say, may I have a bowl of pho? But, you're, you know, it's like mm. the, the painter with one ear, his name is Van Gogh. We don't call him Van Gogh. <laughs> My big pet peeve, and we all have them, is like the stupid travel friend that goes away to Shanghai and comes back after two weeks, you know, like, where oh, were you? Uh, I was at yeah. Shanghai! <laughs> and I'm just like... Oh my God, please stop it. It's, it's, like the, it's like the cool hipster version of the Senior Frogs shirt from Cancun, you know? 
one tequila, two tequila, three tequila floor. I mean, it's like, I, oh, it drives me nuts. Shanghai! I, 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 it's, people kid me about how I pronounce things in my voiceovers, but I intentionally like to pronounce things like a dorky Midwesterner, because just to make fun of all the people who are like, you know, yes, I love China, especially Shanghai! You know, it's like, okay, we get it. You went to Shanghai. Uh, that's great. Nice. Um, so we have some questions out in the audience, uh, starting right there. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for coming. My question is, was there a bizarre food that you tried that you will never try again or made you super sick? Never try again, uh, I absolutely no. I would try everything again, and here's why. Um, I would rather be a better guest in your home than I would say no thank you. Um, I, a lot of times with my show, you have to remember, I mean, we've done episodes where, I mean, we went into Jeppe's Hostel in Johannesburg, you know, the most dangerous town, at the time, the most dangerous place in the world. Um, uh, Kabul at the time was number two. Um, you know, and little kids coming up to you because they'd never had a white person in their neighborhood and they'd never seen one other than on TV. Uh, it's a lawless part of the town, and there were Zulu grandparents, tribal grandparents, who had been um, taken from their tribal lands and put to work as slaves in the gold mines, who were trying to teach their grandchildren and great-grandchildren their stories and their culture and their food. So sometimes I, when someone gives me something that I may not like, I have to remember that may be half of their food for the day. And if I say, oh, no, thank you, I mean, they're, they're like, I just broke off half of my food for the day to share with you. That may be something that they, and it's not from an abusive scene, where they may have taken from their child just because everyone in the family sacrifices for the guest. This is, this is for our guest. I mean, I was in a situation in the Amazon uh, eating some giant worms, actually coconut grubs, and I noticed that on my banana leaf there were three grubs for lunch. And on everyone else's, including the little children, there were two. And I knew that if I gave the third one back to a child, I would be insulting the parents. So I ate my, you, you just learn how to conduct yourself in what I call the real world, which is not here, it's out there. And I ate mine, and then afterwards, when dad went out to do whatever it was that he was doing, I had a power bar in my knapsack, and I broke it in half and shared it with the kids. And so my conscience was clean, I was a good guest, and you, you have to be observant that way and be, you know, slow down. We're, we're so high-paced in our society, and we're so outcome-oriented that we really do forget about the journey and the fact that all those shadows that are out there, all those shadows in the world, they're people. The world is not made up of fancy wristwatches and sports cars and all the other things that we do and like super cool shoes that I'm jealous of and you know, size 20 jeans that I can't fit into. I can't put a leg in there. Um, you know, that's not what the world is made up of. The world is made up of people. And you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to honor and get people to understand here in our country. We forget the world is about people. Absolutely. Um, next question, right there. Uh, hi, it's nice seeing you in person. I want to know, out of all the places you travel, where would you say has the best food, and what is your favorite dish to eat? Great question. Um, I'm a bright, shiny objects person, so it's always just where I've been. Um, I, I can't confine it to one place. I've been lucky enough to visit 173 countries, uh, many of them multiple times, and I, I eat all the time. Uh, three times a day, sometimes more. Um, I'll give you a couple that come to mind right away. A completely undiscovered and a must go, Cyprus, get there, go there. Um, incredible food, it, 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 you know, it's a cross between Italian and Greek food, shot through a prism of uh, an island style that is unique there, that with dishes that are only available there because it's an island and where uh, assimilation of other dishes uh, really doesn't exist. Um, Croatia, especially the southern part of the country on the, co the Dalmatian coast. The Dalmatian coast of Croatia is what Italy was like 150 years ago. The food there is amazing. The easy answer is Vietnam, Thailand, Japan, China. I'm kind of China obsessed, um, but I'm really obsessed with small little villages that I go to, especially in the northwestern part of the country. Um, 
uh, that has more in common with Central Asian countries than it does with the rest of the PRC and whole mutton dishes cooked in their own fat with these, you know, it's cold and everyone works really hard and there's, they're a, mil a milk and meat culture. I mean, some people have never seen a vegetable. They have no idea what it is. Um, and the food there is absolutely out of this world wonderful because the cooks there are inventive, but they're only working with like nine ingredients all the time. And what they do with it is really wonderful. I, people always ask me about best and stuff like that. And I always, I always tell people, just gain experiences. The most valuable thing that I have in my head is this world of flavors and, and taste memories and smells that no other human being on earth has. Um, and the best thing that I've ever had has been wild food in a setting. Like sometimes you go to a restaurant, right? And your friends say, oh, why'd you go there for a hamburger? The hamburgers are better down the street at Freddy's Bar. And you're like, yeah, but this place, they know me. I like the ladies there, the seat's comfortable. I feel, I feel better about me when I'm in there. It's like really cool, my, the girls are cuter. I mean, whatever it is that gets you there. And you know, those meals for me are the ones that I remember the most, the ambiance. So, you know, being with the tribal people, you know, with the Chaga, you know, or some of the other tribes, you know, being in the jungles of Uganda with a big fat African moon rising up out of the trees and eating some crazy jungle animal that only eats crazy nuts and the meat is sweet and tastes like roast pork. And I'm just like, I'm bugging because it's so amazing. It's just a roasted piece of meat, but it's everything else that goes around it. That's the stuff that I really love. Nice, and uh, one last question right there. During the course of your travels, is there anything you've learned that you've applied to your own life? Fantastic question. Uh, I write a lot about this, I talk about this. This is my favorite thing to wax poetically about. Um, let me give you the short answer. Travel is unique. Not being a tourist, travel. The power of travel is transformative. It will change who you are. When you are on the road and you go to Cancun and you check into the hotel with a bunch of books and you just drink beers with your buddies for four days on the beach, um, you learn nothing. When you go to um, Guatemala and you spend a week on your own, crisscrossing the country, taking buses, talking to people, it forces you to get out of your comfort zone. It forces you to learn the language, try new foods, take risks. We're naturally risk averse as human beings. We like being right in our comfort zone. Your cell phone's not gonna work. You're, you're forced to talk to people. There's no TV in the place that you're sleeping at night. You actually have to try to talk to people. So maybe you learn a little bit of the language. It changes you forever. You actually walk in someone else's shoes. I've gone to places in Africa where the tribes have made the string to catch the birds in a little snap snare and to be helpful. I've whipped out my knife to cut it and the jeuntoisie shaman is like, no, 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 don't cut it. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? Like, you know, we cut the Christmas tree down off the top of the car every time we string it on there. And he's like, that's our string. Mm. You know, they don't have personal possessions. Everything is shared by the group. and. Cutting that, that string will be good for two years. Re, reuse the string. I came back from that trip the greenest son of a bitch you've ever seen. I got more recycling bins. Travel changes you. It forever changes you. Being a tourist does not. I wrote a great article in the current issue of Delta Sky Magazine telling a couple stories and uh, giving some tips on how to get lost, even in your own city, to get lost. How many people here from Queens? Right on, nice. my favorite borough. <laughs> For those of you who are not from Queens, go all the way out to the furthest end, go to the last stop on the subway, and then make your way, do that in the morning, and then make your way back eating neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood without asking questions for directions. You, you do that, you will be a different, you'll come across Burkharan Bakeries in Rigo Park. You'll come across, you know, Kebabish, this fantastic little Pakistani place that makes the best karikat uh, outside of, you know, the, the country of origin. I mean, it's, you'll, you'll see people who are New Yorkers that don't speak English and you will share in the wonder of our city in a different way. You'll look at it differently, physically and metaphorically. And it changes, it changes who you are inside. I think it makes you a, a more humanistic person. I call it globalism. I, you know, I think there's a compassionate, new pioneering spirit that's out there that gives us, um, 
I mean, we've lost our ability to navigate the world, and I want people to start navigating. Get, go get lost and make your way back home, and you will learn things about yourself that you never imagined you could. Mm. Well, guys, go out there and buy some plane tickets and check out Bizarre Foods on Travel Channel. Tuesday night. There we go. Andrew Zimmern.